Thank you, Drew. So grateful for you guys and uh, so grateful for all of you. Hope you're doing well. Good to have you here. You survived another week. Congratulations. And uh, I'm honored that you're here with us today. You know, we have a little puppy at our house and um, recently she kind of got stuck. And she was behind this little playpen area that we've set up for her. Uh, the gate was open, but she was stuck behind it. And, uh, you know, she just kept looking at me like, you got to get me out of here. I'll show you a little picture so you understand what, I, what I'm talking about. Like, like the gate's open. All she needs to do is back up or go forward just a little bit. Like she's totally free, but she's completely confused and stuck in this moment. And she went back for a little bit. Then she went forward a little bit. And eventually she gave up and just sat down. And she's looking at me like, dude, are you going to open this up for me or not? Are you just going to stand there and stare at me? Can't you see that I'm stuck? And I tried to get her to move. I even got treats out, you know, all the things that you try to do to get your dog to like dial in. But, but she was, in her mind, completely stuck. And when I finally rescued her, I thought, you know, I'm a lot like our little puppy, Stella. I think many times in my own life, I've gotten stuck and... Sometimes I'm praying for God to open a door. Some of you right now, you're praying for God to open a door. You know what I'm talking God, open a door in our marriage. Open a door in our, in, at work. Open a door in my career. God, open a door. And you're crying out to God, open a door, open a door, open a door. And maybe what God wants to do is open our heart and open our eyes. Because the limitations that we're facing may be self-imposed. Hello. Sometimes we're like, God, open a door. And God's like, first, I got to open your heart because you're not ready to walk through that door. And once your heart is ready, then you can walk through the door. And so here's Stella in this moment, trapped. I finally get her out. And I'm like, man, I'm a, I'm a lot like her. And one of the greatest things that causes barriers in my life, and I think many of our lives, is this whole area of pride. Sometimes I'm just too proud to learn from others and to realize my own mistakes. Sometimes I'm too selfish to really grow and expand my heart so that I can move into the opportunities God has for me. I don't really always want to see them. John Maxwell uh, years ago wrote a book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And in this book, he says the number one law of leadership is the law of the lid. The law of the lid says that your leadership capabilities, where they're currently at, produce a lid in your life. And if you want to go to another level as a leader, you've got to improve your capabilities so that you're able to raise your leadership lid. The people who follow you or are impacted by you, family, friends, work associates, whatever, will rarely rise above you as their leader. They'll often be in a place where if you don't lift the lid, they also won't rise. So if you lift the lid, it can not only impact you, it can impact your kids, your family, and on and on. And today I want to talk to you about what I think is maybe the most important heart condition to allow all of us to grow and lift the lid in our lives and to get out of some of these stuck areas that are self-imposed. I want to talk to you about something that if we'll embrace it and engage in it can make you a better parent, a better uh, son or daughter, can make you a better boss, a better leader, a better um, co-worker, a better friend, and I think just a human being that loves life a whole lot more. Today I want to talk to you about the power of humility. And how a humble heart, which means an open and a teachable heart, a, a humble heart will serve you to grow as a leader and to grow as a mom and a dad and to rise to whole new levels and to lift your lid. And sometimes that bar that we think is in front of us is not a bar at all. When we humble ourselves and start growing and learning, we realize we could actually just walk right around this thing. But when we get proud and shut our minds down and refuse to learn or listen to others, sometimes we stay stuck 
in a self-imposed situation. We've been looking at the life of David, and uh, we've been in this series called King of Hearts. And we've said, you know, like week one, we talked about how God came and he chose this young man, David, to be the future king of Israel. And Samuel comes and anoints him with oil, this amazing moment. And we said, look, it wasn't because David had it all together, but David's heart was focused on being faithful to God. There was something about his heart. God, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. So David's chosen to be king. Week two, we talked about how David as a shepherd would worship in private. And we said those private moments of worship were key to his public influence. And we don't always think about it, but when, when your private moments of just prayer, reflection, spending time with God, reflecting on all that God has done, those private moments God can use to shape your heart and to prepare you for public influence. Right? That's what happened in David's life. Last week, Pastor Nick gave a great message about David and Goliath and kind of all the, the most famous battle in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. But this week, um, after the battle of, of David and Goliath, David becomes famous. Like people are talking about him everywhere. He wins more battles. He eventually takes one of Saul the king's daughters in marriage. Like he becomes best friends with the king's son, Jonathan, and Jonathan actually affirms on his own initiative, like, David, you will be the future king. Everybody can see it. God's hand is on this dude. He's going to be the king. And they start singing a new song in Israel, the ancient version of Spotify. And the song goes like this. Saul, the king, Saul's killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. You can look it up. You can read it. It's the song they sang. What does that mean? It means Saul's pretty good, but David's awesome. And so Saul, as the king, starts getting jealous. We've already talked about he was paranoid, and he starts looking over his shoulder. If you've ever worked for a paranoid leader, you know what this is all about. He doesn't want anybody else to kind of rise up and get that kind of influence in his country that he's leading in his own mind. And so he basically gets more and more open about the fact that he's going to kill David. So David finally has to flee, even though he's been for the king and wants to serve the king and he's just trusting God to work this process out. He has to flee for his life. He's living in caves. He's living on the run. And finally, Saul says, you know what? He knows where David is. He gets 3,000 of his best fighting men and he goes to take David. David out. David's hiding in the caves. By the way, if you, if you, you look through the Psalms, the songbook of Israel in the Old Testament, some of the Psalms will say uh, a Psalm of David um, when he was hiding in the caves, running for his life. And so <laughs> Saul shows up, 3,000 of his best fighters, and he sees a little cave off to the side, and he's kind of got to go take care of his business. He's got to go to the boys' room. So he slides into that cave over on the side, and he's like, I'm just going to take care of my stuff. And he goes in to do a little ancient version of scrolling, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and he walks into the cave that David is hiding in. Now think about how crazy this is. According to the Bible, he comes into the very cave David's in, and he's like, his David's people are next to him are like, hey, man. God just delivered the king into your hands. Kill him. Just take him out. I mean, God gave you this moment. And here's Saul. Takes care of his robes, all his stuff. He's in the most vulnerable position you can imagine. He's alone. It's a dark cave. And David is right there. And this is what David says in that moment. Chapter 24, verse 6. Help me out when we get to the red word. David says, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has what? Chosen him. David says, you know what? There are some things that are above my pay grade, and killing the king is not in my pay grade. And even though the king was making his life miserable, even though the king was in many ways destroying his life, even though he's hiding in the hills, he says, God, basically, if you want this done, you're going to have to do it because I'm not going to do it because that's the Lord's chosen one. He didn't feel right about it. And I think it was humility that drove his heart to say, you know what? I know my place. 
and it is not my place to take things in my own power. Have you ever thought about this? Sometimes courage is standing up and speaking. Sometimes courage is standing up and taking action, and sometimes courage is being silent. Sometimes courage is saying, I'm not gonna take action in this moment. I'm not gonna walk all over somebody. I'm not gonna take somebody else's life. I'm not gonna destroy somebody so that I can advance. Sometimes courage says, God, I could, but I won't. I'm gonna trust you to work it out and take care of it. And so how do we develop a heart that looks more like David's, who's a person after God's own heart? Well, the first thing is to just develop a humble heart. Develop a humble heart. Uh, you know, it could be challenging getting older. I saw a few things on social media I thought were pretty funny. Uh, check this out. One person says um, this. Let's bring up this. One of my students wrote a sentence that begins, in the late 1900s. <laughs> Uh, I had to reread it three times to realize what was going on. My feelings are hurt. My daughter did this uh, as well in school, and I remember like, what, are you, what do you mean? Uh, all right, here's the next one. You, I'm only 35. I have my whole life ahead of me. Sports broadcaster. Here comes the oldest player in the league. He's 32. A miracle. <laughs> all right, one more. This person says, I got carded at the grocery store while getting my ID, my Blockbuster card fell out. The clerk laughed and said, never mind. <laughs> it's like, you're good, man. You qualify. You're even older than you look. A lot of times when we think about humility, we just think about being humbled or being kind of knocked down a level. But humility at the core biblically means strength under control. I mean, Moses was this incredible leader, and the Bible says he was called the most humble man alive at the time. He was strong. He confronted Pharaoh. He led the Israelites out of captivity into freedom. He was an amazing leader, but he was humble. Is that strength was brought under control. David was a humble man. Jesus is described as humble. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus gives us this insight into who he is. It's unlike anything else in the rest of the Bible. It's the only place where Jesus tells us what his heart is, like who he is at his core in his own words. Check this out. Matthew 11, 28. Jesus says, says, then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am what? humble and gentle at heart. This is the only time in the New Testament Jesus tells us what his heart is. And he says, if you wanna know my heart, it's humble and it's gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. So there's a couple simple ideas here. If you wanna understand, we're talking about the king of hearts, you wanna understand Jesus' heart? Humble, humble means lowly or, or modest. It can even mean approachable. It's strength under control. And Jesus says, I'm humble. You can come to me, you can bring your burdens to me, you can bring your cares, your concerns to me. And he's gentle, which, which literally means kind and forgiving and even humane. And if I want to exemplify what it means to be a follower of Jesus, I would do well to start right here, to be teachable and modest and humble and to be gentle. <laughs> now, I made the mistake this week on Friday of opening up Twitter. <laughs> Social media is crazy right now, y'all. And I mean, I... I, I, was, I watched people throw mud at each other and go after each other, and it was more like verbal warfare. Everybody's entrenched in their views, everybody's already got their minds made up, and everybody's just throwing grenades, right? And I walked away from that, and my prayer for myself was, God, help me just be humble, and help me be more gentle. Help me, help me, I wanna have the heart. It can be courageous, be strong, but I still want to have a humble, gentle heart. Like, that's the heart Jesus had. That's who he was. And if you're asking the question, like, how should I react and respond right now? If you're a follower of Jesus, I think this is a powerful guide. Humility and gentleness. It's countercultural as well. It will help you. Humble people are open. Humble people are willing to listen. 
Humble people are willing to have conversations. Humble, hum, humble people can acknowledge we don't have to, degree, to agree on everything to love each other. Humble people can admit if we're going to live in a democratic, civilized society, if that's what we're going to do, then it is going to take a lot of push and pull, a lot of compromise, a lot. Like humble people can embrace that because they're open. And at work, humble people, look, I've worked for some diff, a lot of different bosses. You, you guys work for some different bosses, right? Most of them, most of the bosses I work for were really good. A couple, <laughs> not so much. One in particular I remember was uh, kind of a, um, it wasn't like a moral issue. It wasn't like this person was immoral. They just, they weren't competent. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I just went right into somebody's workplace. And everybody around them was always attacking them and always sort of going after them. There was so much negativity. You know, when that's going on in a, in a workplace, in a culture, you, it's in the air, right? It's just pretty soon like everybody's taking their shots and morale gets bad, everything is bad. And I can remember in those moments like um, just being surprised because this leader thought they had all the answers, but they, everything seemed to be falling apart. And then I can remember another leader coming into a job and thinking like, this leader's not going to make it. They just, they walk in and they don't, they don't have any ideas. All they do is sit back and say, what do you guys think? What do you think? And what do you think? And what do you think? And tell me more about that and explain that to me. Oh, that's a great idea. Maybe we should do that. And I remember initially just kind of sitting there like, this isn't going to end well. And what I didn't understand is that was a very sharp leader who was leading with questions because that's what humble leaders do. Instead of coming in with an answer, because if you come in as a leader with an answer, you just shut down all the conversation. They came in with a question. They pulled all the best ideas from everybody. Then they empowered people to go do their ideas. And then when they had success, they held them up as the person who had the idea and won because they realized if they win, I win, right? It's what Jim Great talk, uh, It's what uh, uh, Jim Collins talked about years ago in his book Good to Great, where they looked at like the greatest uh, long-term CEOs, the most effective CEOs, and they said, "Look, what's a level five leader? One of the highest characteristics of a level five, highest level leader, long-term success over decades, they were humble. When the organization failed, they took personal responsibility, and when it succeeded, they gave all the credit away." They were humble leaders. David showed himself to be a humble leader. And if we will develop a humble heart, we can grow. All right, here's another thought, and that is to honor all around. To honor all around. Uh, I read this week that millennials will take 25,000 selfies over the course of their life. <laughs> Come on, millennials, 25,000. You know your great-grandparents had like two pictures? Right? Maybe they have one with themselves in it. Now it's like 25,000 pictures of ourselves, and the majority are now edited. Got to be on, gotta be on brand, y'all. And I'm all for selfies. That's great. But do you ever wonder, like, in a culture that is very obsessed with self-ease, very obsessed with ourselves, if we don't kind of pin ourselves into a corner where we start thinking life is about us, and let me, I'm just telling you, if you want to be miserable, make life all about you, right? If you want to make the people around you miserable, make your life all about you. If you want a sense of joy, realize that, that life isn't simply about you. The very first sentence of the Bible says this, in the beginning, you. No, that's not what it says. It says, in the beginning, God. And the Bible's saying from the first sentence, like, life's not about us. It's about God. And the quicker we get there, the quicker you can get to some joy and some happiness and some humility in your life. Thank God it's not all on our shoulders. God, it's about him, and he's carrying it, and he has it, and we get the chance to serve him. And David seems to have this awareness, this humility that realizes Something greater is at work. It's, if it was just all about him, he would have taken Saul out in that moment in the cave because his life was miserable. But instead he says, no, God, it's about you. And instead, as Saul's taking care of his business, David sneaks up 
and he cuts a part of his robe. And then he slides back into the darkness. And so he has a moment where he takes a part of the robe. Saul then leaves the cave and goes out. And here's what we read, 1 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse 7. After Saul had left the cave and gone his way, David came out and shouted after him, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked around, David what? Bowed low before him. Now, this is the guy who wants to kill him. This is the guy who's coming after him. This is the guy that's like making his life miserable. But even then, do you see this? He bowed before him. He honored somebody who was acting very dishonorable. He honored his position as the king, even though he disagreed with most of what he was doing. Honor is something that we have lost in our culture, haven't we? Like, we just, it just feels like we are less and less inclined to honor anybody or anything. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's endemic, cancel culture, all the things. Like, like, we've lost honor. But honor, I think, is one of the ways that we show humility in our lives. We honor those in authority over us. We honor our friends and family. We honor people around us. And it will, I think, have a direct impact on you and your life and your future. I think when you learn to be an honoring person, you will then receive honor back in your life. And so here's David in this moment, and he shows at the core of who he is that he honors even somebody that really isn't worth honoring in that moment. He bows low before him, and he, he addresses him as my Lord, the King. Honor is powerful in our lives. I remember years ago working for a leader that, um, you know, there was a lot of negative talk about him. And, and, I, and I remember I had to make a choice, like, like, what did I believe about honor and life and work? And I finally came to this place. And in this case, I, be I believed that God had placed them in that, leader, that pastoral leadership position, and I was serving under him. And I believed it was my job to do one of two things, either serve under the leader God put me under or leave. But I didn't think there was a third option, which was stay around and sabotage everything the leader did. Hello. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Like, a lot of people are like, there's a third option. Just go around and make everybody miserable. But I felt like, you know, those were my sort of two options. And so I just kind of came to a place of realizing my job is to help this leader succeed. And I did everything I could to come along them, shore up their weaknesses, kind of run the gaps, do what I could to make them better. And when people would start gossiping about them, I would shut it down. I would, I would say positive things. I would point to the good things, and there were some good things. I would bring, and it's amazing. Listen, when you shut gossip down, it stops flowing to you. Come on, somebody. Now, listen. I'm going to talk to somebody right now. You know, if gossip is always coming your way, negative gossip about all the things going on, and you're like, I don't know. People just love to bring this stuff to me. I want to suggest to you that that gossip flows to you for a reason. But when you say, I won't be a gossip, and I won't participate in this kind of gossip, and you shut it down, it's amazing how fast the gossip dries up. People are like, you're no fun. <laughs> but I'm a lot happier. I got a lot more joy because I'm, I'm living in a state of honoring others. The New Testament says this, honor one another as better than yourselves. Honor one another as better than yourselves. See if that shows up on your social media feed. We're supposed to, the New Testament also says this, outdo one another with honor. I mean, outdo one another. with. So I believe the humble are happier. I believe they're more connected. They're more relationally rich. And I believe the more you send honor out, the more it returns. And I know there's a lot of reasons to be cynical. If you live long enough, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to have people fail you. You're going to fail people. You're going to see people be dishonored. You're going to see people being dishonorable. And like me, you're going to make a lot of mistakes yourself. But even though I've made mistakes, God has been good to 
to me. And even though I have held grudges, God has forgiven me. And even though I've been impatient and harsh, God has been patient and kind with me. And even though I've been selfish and unloving and unlovable, God has loved me and cared for me. Listen, cynicism may come naturally. Cynicism may come naturally, but so does misery. People that honor are going to have more joy, and they're going to feel more alive, and they're going to be more hopeful. So my challenge to you is not only develop a humble heart, but develop an honoring heart. And one of the ways you can do that is practice what we might call positive gossip. Maybe this week. Just think about good things that you can say about people behind their back. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like you're at work and you're standing there and you're like, you know, one thing I love about so-and-so is they always genuinely seem to care about the people they're trying to lead. Or one thing I appreciate about this guy over here, he's a beast in the gym. Have you seen him in the gym? Or man, you know what I love about that person is, man, they always make a room light up when they come in, or they always find the good in others. Or, or you know, I saw so-and-so out doing a certain uh, kind thing for somebody else. Here's the thing, have you noticed that when, you, when there's gossip going on, negative gossip, it often will get back to the person that's being gossiped about. You ever been on the other end of that and you're like, it might be six months or a year later, it might be down the road, but it's amazing how it's a lot of times those things come back around to you. But have you ever thought about this? When you're positive in what you say about people, sometimes that whole vibe can come back around to you as well. So, honor is positive gossip. That's what a humble heart engages in. Here's a third thought, to have a heart more like David's and more like God's, and that is to trust God with your future, to trust him with your future. So this week, my wife has been gone overseas. She's been in Romania and Poland and uh, working with one of our missions partners, uh, World Help. So many of you have contributed to our disaster relief fund, and since the Ukraine war began, 100% of uh, those gifts have gone to support two organizations, World Help and Convoy of Hope, which are doing amazing work with refugees and the refugee crisis. So Lori got a chance to go and see some of what was going on, World Help, see some of what World Help uh, was doing. And she said at one point in Romania, they got to, well, first of all, they, they, they went to a church, and this was a church of 35 people not far from the border, and they found that um, these 35 people took in 14 adults and 60 kids. Here's, here's a photo of what happened to this church. It blew up. And so this little church, they don't speak the same language. Like they speak different languages than the Ukrainian refugees. They, many of them have the same faith in the same Lord, but, but they have, they're pouring their hearts out. Like the headlines start moving on, but there are hundreds and thousands of cases like this where people are serving. And what World Help's doing is coming alongside churches like this and helping support them financially and helping provide uh, resources to them. One of the things in Romania, they got to meet with a member of the Romanian parla parliament. Lori said that that, that Romani Romanian parliament member said that when the whole crisis of the war happened and everybody was trying to figure out what to do, he said, the first people at the border was the church. He said, the city leaders didn't know what to do. We were in shock. He said, we were all trying to figure out what to happen. And he said, across the board, it was the church that was there first. It was the church that helped people first. It was the church that wanted to serve. And so this guy was praising these local pastors because he was like, you guys were, you were there first. And uh, that's a humble heart. In Lori's conversations, she said again and again, the people would say, we don't know why this is happening. And it's changed our whole lives and it's upended everything, but we trust God. And we believe that God is moving and working even in this horrible situation. And she said to see their faith, 
just filled her with tremendous courage and hope. I mean, here's David. His whole life has been upended. Everything's upside down. He's living in the caves. He's hiding, you know, and now he gets this moment where he could potentially take out Saul, but he says, you know what? I'm trusting God for the future. I'm not going to take it into my own hands and do something that I think is wrong. I'm going to trust God to work it out. And so 1 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse 15, David says this to uh, Saul. He says, may the Lord therefore judge which of us is right, gotta love this, and punish the guilty one. Saul. He is my advocate, and he will what? Rescue me from your power. Who's David trusting in that moment? He's trusting God for his future. He's my advocate. He will rescue me. And he's yelling this to Saul. And then David holds up the robe, the piece that he cut from his robe, and Saul looks down and realizes, what? <laughs> and Saul is very moved because he realizes David could have killed me, and if it roles were reversed, I would have killed him. David holds this piece up as if to say, look, I've never been against you. I've never tried to overthrow you or take your place of power, and I'm not trying to now. And Saul, in that moment, he says, David, literally, you can read it. He says, you're a better man than me. And he's, he's humbled. And he admits, one day you will be king. Because he can see this is a different kind of leader. He says, one day you will be king. And he says that when you are king, take care of my family. Promise me you will take care of my family. And David actually kept this promise. You see it years later in his life. He honored the family of the man who tried to kill him. And I wish I could tell you after this, Saul was like, we're good. You just showed me you're, you're not trying to overthrow me. Everything's good. But no, the crazy would continue. Remember that Ozzy Osbourne song, Crazy Train? You know, like, like he was on the crazy train, all aboard. And, and, and this decision to say, God, I'm, I'm trusting the future to you would make his life harder, not easier. It would mean more years of hiding, more years of running, more years of madness, more years of craziness before God eventually took care of Saul. But David trusted God with his future. And that's just an encouragement to you today. Look, I know it's hard in our country right now with inflation and expenses and all of that, and you're trying to save money and navigate everything, and, and you should do the best you can with your money, but also trust God with your future, and trust God to provide. Look, none of us know what's coming tomorrow, and sometimes you can look around and be like, man, I don't even, what's going on in our country? But you can trust God for your future, and it is God that we serve. You look around your family and your kids, and you're like, man, are my kids, are they ever going to like fill in the blank? but you could trust God for your future and for their future. It doesn't mean life's always gonna get easier in the near future, but it means you sit back and you say, a humble heart realizes I'm not in control. I have an open hand. God, you have the future. You carry things. It's in your hands, and I trust myself to you. And so this week, my challenge to you is be humble, and be gentle. A lot of things being said, a lot of things being posted, families being divided, homes being ripped apart by different opinions that people are throwing around. I, I get it, and I'm sensitive to that. And I would just say, try to be humble, try to be gentle. You can be strong, you can have an opinion, but try to, try to share it in a way that remembers the heart of Christ, humility and gentleness. And then maybe this week, try to honor those around you. Instead of just engaging in the constant teardown aspects of our culture, look for ways to honor a family member, a friend, your kids. Maybe share some positive gossip behind somebody's back. And trust God. Trust God through it all. Look to God more than you look to the news. 
Look to God more than you look to all the fear-mongering all around us. Trust that God has the future. And I think with humble hearts, we'll find ourselves happier. We'll find ourselves more able to grow. And we may realize the bars that we thought were in front of us, right? The stuckness that we were experiencing was self-imposed. And actually the whole time we could just grow and walk around those bars and lift the lid in our lives and move forward in the goodness and power of God. You may be praying for an open door, but God may want to open your heart so that when he opens the door, you're ready to walk through it. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith in your life. I'd love to give you that opportunity just to reach out to God and to trust him in your life and to ask him to move and work. And so um, if you're here and God's been tapping you on the shoulder, if he's been calling you to come home to him, I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer to just declare your faith and trust in Christ and to begin that spiritual journey. Would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just repeat this prayer after me. You can say it out loud or in your own heart and mind. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. And help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Friends, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I just want to ask you, wherever you're at, would you just slip your hand in the air? Just make eye contact with me, just to say before God, to say to me, you're going to follow him and trust him in your life. Just slip your hand in the air. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. God, I thank you for your love, and I just thank you for each person reaching out to you today. And I pray you'll fill them with your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, your love. God, we thank you for Jesus and all that he means for each of us in our lives. And we pray that you'll watch over us and protect us as we follow you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.